What's up everyone, debug.log here. Welcome to the latest devlog of my attempt to create a horror game that I hope one day Markiplier will play in three scary games. Let's just hop right into it. As I mentioned in the last episode, I am currently using Monday to log my game's features and bugs to keep me on track. And quickly, I skimmed over my list and selected the ticking clock task as I thought it would be good to add to the ambiance of this school-based horror game. Thankfully, I created this asset a few years ago, and it's available on the Unity Asset Store, and it already has a ticking clock script. You can buy the School Essentials Pack, which comes with a clock, a school bell, a drinking fountain, and a bit more, using the link in the description down below. I just had to make sure the audio source was set up properly, and then I had to move the clock game object outside of the static objects group, because a moving ticking clock is not static. Static means it doesn't move, it, it moves, you know, its hand moves. Off camera, I created an audio mixer, quieted the footstep sounds, and fixed the background ambient noise, and I feel things sound much, much better. Done and done. Next, these two other classrooms are completely naked. No, no, pl please, please don't look at them. I'm gonna have to censor that. Let's duplicate all the chairs and tables from the main pig classroom and drag them over into our beautiful new classrooms. Let's make some quick adjustments. Hmm, nice, neat, and orderly. It's very strange of this room as the other two classrooms are chaotic and destroyed. And then I attempted to put some in-game text on this chalkboard, and that didn't seem to work out so well. I'll come back to this in a future video. At this point, I stopped recording. Why, you may ask? Well, I wanted to create some scares that once this game is released, no one who's watching my videos will know they're coming. Be prepared. Some things are just too good to show you now. Moving on, I think it would be great to be able to pick up and throw the basketball. Maybe we can play catch with a ghost at some point. So initially, let's just make this basketball inherit from the interactive item script and we should be able to pick it up. No problem. Here we go. Well, that didn't work out. All right, let's uncheck the use gravity checkbox for the rigid body and see what happens. Well, it stops bouncing. Great, but it's not letting me take the ball. Hmm, ah, I just forgot to make it takeable in my interactable item script here. Now everything's going to work just, what the? Either this ball's a mind of its own or I'm freaking Stretch Armstrong. I just can't, for the life of me, figure out why I can't pick up this basketball. I've tried everything, made it take bull, told, told it not to use gravity, and checked it off as is kin kinematic. And this thing just doesn't want to cooperate. Oh, never mind. I see. Now I know what I must do. Let's modify the interactable item script to allow any interactable item that has a rigid body to be picked up by just setting the rigid body to is kinematic. Now to make it where we can throw the set object or basketball, we just need to add that functionality when we hold the mouse button down. And though I wrote the script off screen, I can say it simply looks at how much time has passed while holding your mouse button down to determine if you are trying to throw an object. Then to throw the object, it sets the rigid body as not kinematic, sets the parent as null so it's back in the world space, adds a force in the direction of the camera's facing direction, and it's off back as a rigid body basketball. Yay! 
It flies. Now we can move the throwing objects task over to completed. And let's pick up another from this never ending list. Oh, let's mention one big change in my Unity project that happened in the middle of all the basketball stuff. This. Colors. I came to the realization that Unity's hierarchy looks like crap. So I did a quick Google search and found this really cool third party package that adds some capabilities directly into the hierarchy. This little add-on allows us to add icons to particular prefabs or icons to particular classes. It colorizes each row to distinguish things apart. It lets you set certain game objects as game holding positions, which I've always used, turns that to a certain color. And it does that, but it has to be tagged with the tag editor only and start with whatever starting characters you want it to start with. In my case, four dashes. It even allows you to enable and disable game objects directly in the hierarchy rather than having to go to the properties window. This simple add-on has been a lifesaver. There is a link in this hierarchy's GitHub available for you down in the description below. Okay, where were we? Moving back to working on some of those dirty decals, which led me figuratively down a rabbit hole. Off camera, I set up collisions for the bleachers in the gym. After that, I explored a bit and noticed the inside of the gym could be seen from the outside in the courtyard, which is a big no-no. So now I built a set of large brick walls blocking your view. With even further analysis, I decided the gym is a bit too tall. So I deleted the top set of walls. Standing out in this courtyard, I decided it wasn't pretty enough and the gym's exterior walls kind of started to blend with the courtyard walls and visually wasn't working for me. So I created some accent pieces of brick slabs using a different color brick texture and stack those around the courtyard as if they were brick support pillars for the building. I added some sort of soffit to the roof using the same brick material and then placed these details on the gym walls as well. This really gave the area a more natural look and provided more perspective between the courtyard and the gym. While adding this detail, I noticed the bushes in the courtyard were Z fighting. If you see this glitchy artifacting while developing your game, it simply means that two or more objects are fighting each other to the death. Well, they're actually fighting each other to render in front of the other. This is caused when the faces of the objects are parallel and share the exact same or near same positioning. To fix this, we just have to move one face in front or behind the other, maybe a few decimal units, or just simply don't let them overlap. All right, things are looking better, but the gym still seems to extend above the wall by a few feet. So into Blender I go to make the gym just a tad bit shorter. I just realized I probably could have just made this shorter in Unity, but oh well, it's probably better to do it this way anyways. The rabbit hole doesn't end there. I was going to work on making it where windows can break for scare purposes, and then I got sidetracked once again. This happens a lot, I think. And instead of doing that, I added a few more grungy decals and planted some grass in the courtyard. I then cleaned up the list on Monday, the app, and downloaded a basketball model for free to replace my beautiful gray one. Opened the texture of that model in Photoshop and added a bit more grunge to it. Perfecto. Now I decided that I really wanted hands in the game, but as you can see, they're broken. Stuck it is. <clears throat> Then I moved on to something I thought was accomplishable. I wanted it when you turn really fast or sprint that any lit object will go out abruptly because that's what happens with that type of stuff, right? And if you run with a lighter, it goes out. If you run with a candle, it'll probably go out. So at this point I wondered, how do I determine the candle's velocity so I can compare that to its tolerance and blow out the flame? Well. I thought I could just add a rigid body to these items and check the rigid body's velocities. However, however, the velocity of rigid bodies being moved by their transforms doesn't register as rigid body movement because there's no force really being added to that rigid body to make it move. So that doesn't work. So instead, I decided to grab the distance the flame bearing object move 
every 20th of a second, and if it moved beyond the tolerance distance, it would be extinguished. I noticed on the Monday to-do list, three tasks were related to the flames going out, so I combined those into one task and made subtasks. Running with fire is now completed. Too hot to handle, locked and loaded. I did the coding of this off screen, but a brief explanation. The lighter gets hotter when it's ignited. Once the temperature of the lighter reaches its max, it automatically turns off. If the player tries to turn it back on right away, it will turn off almost immediately as it has not had enough time to cool down. And that's all I have for you in this episode. If you like what you saw, kick that like button right in the face. Subscribe if you like game development or if you want to see the progress of this game. If there's anything you want or think you'd like to see in the game, let me know your ideas in the comments down below. With that, I'll see you guys again next time here on debug.log. Peace.